I had intense fear and panic because we were obviously crashing. Out of my heart came the thought, oh God, help, I'm going to die. From the time that they pronounced me dead was a good 45 minutes. It's determined that I was not breathing for 20 minutes. They cut my clothes and then they paddled my heart because my heart had stopped. And I could see people screaming and crying, but I didn't realize that was actually my physical body because I was somewhere else. About 20 past four in the afternoon, by half past seven, I was dead, clinically dead, four minutes. And they were crying because I was dead. And I was trying to tell them, no, I'm, I'm not dead, I'm just fine, I'm okay. I was greeted by people I had known in the past. I started to feel like I was surrounded by all this warm, loving, beautiful, soothing, loving energy. I'm back with God again. I just felt this almighty release, like, wow. I'm back. I'm back home again. Incredibly safe and felt at home. I'd come back home. It was a very strong feeling that I'd come back home. The only thing that I could feel, if you could imagine, absolute love and peace. There wasn't anything else to be felt. And light is literally emitting from him. And I could feel that that tremendous amount of love was coming through him as well. They were brighter than everybody else. And... I just knew who they were. Welcome, everybody, to Round Trip Death. We are super thrilled to have Peter Bedard with us today from sunny, sunny Southern California. How are you, Peter? I am fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to see you. Now, I think when I say Southern California, most people are thinking along the coast. Right. But you're a desert man. I am. I love the heat. It's amazing here. I was saying earlier that our winters are many places summer. So we, we have beautiful winters that are in the 70s and 80s and our summers do get hot, but it's been remarkably cool. It's only 88 degrees today, which in June we should be around 100. So for us, it's, uh, it's, it's just a lifestyle. You learn to adapt to the desert. We have tons of festivals awesome cool things out here i love i love living in the desert that sounds great a lot of retired people as well yeah it actually predominantly was hollywood it was your it was medicinal so there's a lot of hot springs here so a lot of people came here over the years especially back in the day for the hot springs and then you know hollywood the rat pack and all that type of stuff really made hot springs famous and a lot of people retired here and now it's it's turning into like me more of a year-round community I'm part of our business chamber, and we do all kinds of really just amazing stuff. I, I just love living out here. Well, I warned you I was going to do this. Our listeners want to find out who Peter is. Tell us just a little bit about you, and then we're going to jump right into your NDE. So go for it. Okay. So I, who am I? I am, I am the, I am the divine present as an individual. Now. Um, I I live out here in the desert. I'll believe whatever you tell me. You go right ahead. <laughs> well, you know, it's that philosophy question. Who are you? I am that I am. <laughs> right? And, uh, but on the human level, and I, I, I'm just a guy. I lived out in the desert for several years. I grew up in California. I uh, had a, an unusual career path as a kid. I was in the theater, and I was discovered as a dancer, I have the body type of a dancer. You know, there's a football player body type, a basketball player body body type. Uh, I'm very blessed to get older, and I, I, uh, you know, still kind of have that. I've I've certainly put on a little weight, but back when I was younger, I was the guy that, you know, still fit in nice high school jeans Uh, (laughs) for quite a long time. I was a dancer, I and that is part of my near-death story, so I won't go into that too much, but uh, I was a child actor. I lived in LA. I did a lot, nothing really big. I did a lot of stuff in, in London for a while. I came out to LA and I, at some point just decided that I really didn't want to do that anymore. And I got a degree in consciousness studies, a master's degree in consciousness studies. And that's the study of science and religion. So I got to study cosmology and string theory and, and the big bang and all that type of stuff along with the Bhagavad Gita and Christian mysticism and and Buddhism and all types of really wonderful things. It's one of my favorite things that I've done. And I was not a school person. So for me to go back to school and get a master's was 
it meant I really, really loved it. And I still do. I love the intersection between philosophy, theology, and science. It's, it's just an amazing place. I'm going to let our listeners know right now, as you tell your story, they're going to hear some things they have never heard before. And it just, it just kills me that this keeps happening. When I think I've heard it all, I haven't, and I know I never will because everybody's near-death experience is different. And that is so cool about it. All right. Get us back to the Bay Area. You're 17 years old. You're a dancer. What, what's going on in your life? Yeah, so I was I was a, a kid that didn't fit in. I was kind of little Billy Elliot. <laughs> my dad was a Marine uh, and a professional umpire, and my mom was a housewife who sold Avon. <laughs> and then I grew up in the suburbs of Silicon Valley. So as Silicon Valley came into being, it was it, San Jose was where I grew up, the city. And as it came into being. As I grew up, the orchards came down and it turned into from an orchard farming community into what we know today as Silicon Valley. And I grew up in the theater. I grew up in the suburbs. It was a, not the best place for me. It was great for my brother and sister, but I was more of the Billy Elliot story. I don't know if you remember that movie, Billy Elliot. Uh, it came out many years ago. It's the dad who has a gay son and they have to figure out how to do, how to be together, how to connect with each other, how to, lived together and the son just wanted to be the dancer and the dad was a brawler and a drinker and all that type of stuff boozer right that type of thing i like i wanted to go to the museums i wanted to go to theater i wanted to learn all that type of stuff about art music and stuff like that and my parents were very sort of low middle class uh wonderful people but i really didn't fit in (laughs) i didn't fit in at all Give us an idea of what years this was. That'll help people put this in perspective. Sure. Well, I'm in my 50s now. So this was back. I I was born in the 60s. So this is the 70s and 80s. Well, things were changing socially at that time, especially in the Bay Area. Absolutely. That lifestyle was much more accepted all of a sudden. Yes. And I was in the suburbs. So (laughs) So not as much. Not as much (laughs) now. Uh, but l- luckily, I, I was discovered. I, you know, I was put into dance by other people who saw my talents and put me into these scholarship-based classes. We didn't have the money to pay for them. So to be able to have a scholarship uh, and get that training, within my first year of dancing, I was already assistant teaching, which was just a, a, a huge gift. And I felt like I found my home. You know, I found a way to fit in. I found a way to feel safe in my body as a teenager. You know, I, I didn't feel safe in my community. Not that anybody was overtly doing anything, but there was no one like me. I just didn't fit in. And so to have that experience of, of finding where I could excel, you know, it's kind of like the kid discovering that they're a great basketball player. Well, I discovered I was a great dancer and I was good at it and I had to work at it, but it was natural. It came natural to me to be able to dance and perform and and do those types of things. So that was really my home. I didn't necessarily feel safe. And it wasn't that my family was doing anything to make me not feel safe, but just, I was the kid that didn't fit in. There was no, there was no role model. There was nobody like me around. And my, my parents were Catholic and Episcopalian. And there was a lot of that sort of energy coming at me. And again, this was the seventies and eighties. And like you said, there was a lot happening and, you know, people were talking later in the 80s about the AIDS crisis and all that type of stuff going on. And there was a lot of shame. And so I stayed in the closet for a long time because I didn't feel, again, I didn't feel safe being who I was. And it was it was a little bit dangerous because I saw people get beat up being who they were uh, and then people hurt for who they were. And was your dad a, one of those kind of tough, macho military dads? Yeah, kind of. He wasn't. He got kicked out of the Marines because he couldn't take orders. <laughs> 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 my dad did not like anybody taking. He, he didn't like having a boss. So my dad ended up being a mailman where he could just do his job, and they kind of just left him alone. And he was beloved. Our community loved my dad. I grew up with all these kids who knew my dad and thought my dad was absolutely amazing. And yeah, uh, and I was. I, then he was, he was a great guy, but we just didn't know, we didn't have a common language. We didn't know how to speak to each other. And it took a long time 
for us to find that. My parents have come such a long way. I'm so proud of them. They've really come to a point where my nephew, who is gay, they are absolutely supported. My mom literally just showed up at the second Pride Festival in her small town. They live in a small town out in Southern California now, too. And and literally, like, she is wanting to be there and support and and be out there and say, you are loved no matter who you are, and that type of stuff. And, and to have my parents come that way. But I can tell you a very personal story. It's a tangent, but do you want, this, do you want me to tell you the you story? You know, go, go right ahead. <laughs> okay. So a few years back, gosh, this is probably 10 years ago, this was how I knew my father had come to terms and actually accepted me. And it was, it was just such a wonderful experience. I lived in LA. I was in the Hollywood scene. I knew lots of people and I did lots of things. I went to lots of parties and all that type of stuff. And I had met one, I had made friends with one of your first Victoria's Secret supermodels, right? She had become a friend of mine. And you know, the angels, the Victoria's Secret angels, they would wear the lingerie and the angel wings. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Kind oh, of. absolutely. <laughs> sure. I mean, no, no. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, I met one of Sorry, those girls. My wife and my kids might listen. So no, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> I never <laughs> So I met one of the first angels and she was really sweet to me. And she invited me over to for Thanksgiving. And I called up my dad and they said, dad, I don't know what I should do. Should I come home for Thanksgiving? Should I not? I have this invitation to go to the supermodel Thanksgiving. Um, and my dad said to me, which was just one of the, I said, yeah, my heart still softens when I hear, when I tell this story, my dad said, well, don't supermodels have a lot of gay friends? Maybe you should go there and maybe you'll meet someone. And so for my Billy Elliot dad, like Marine umpire, sports fanatic, you know, tough guy dad to tell me that I, he thinks I should go to Thanksgiving at the supermodel's house says, because maybe I'll make a, I'll make a, make a friend or meet a partner, you know, something like that. That was just the moment that I knew that my parents, my father, specifically came around and loved me exactly as I was and wanted me to be happy. And how old were you then? Gosh, it took a long time. I was in my 40s. So that took a long time. It did. It took a long time. There's there's so much misinformation and fear and religiosity and all that type of stuff that just gets in the way of us loving each other. Well, and a big part of the message that we learned from near-death experiences is pure love, period. Absolutely. People d just do not feel judged. It's just love. All right, mm -hmm. let's jump into it. 17-year-old Peter, what's going on? So, as you know, I was involved in performing, and I was, it was my senior year of high school, and I, there was a, there was a little a theater in, in the downtown area near, not far, not too far from my house, and this theater was an old vaudeville theater. It was amazing. It's like, you know, Boo and Hiss and the villain and the, the Red Hot Mama. <laughs> yeah, no, all that stuff. Of course, it did Red Hot Mama, throwing popcorn, all that type of stuff, right? It was, it was amazing. It was so cool. I so wanted to do that. At the time, the drinking age was 18. I was only 17. I was only allowed to be on the stage. I couldn't even step off the stage. I could only be backstage and and because I wasn't old enough to be in a, a, a good environment where they served alcohol. And my grandfather, one of the reasons I was so excited about this, because my grandfather played the banjo. And when he could, he would play in the vaudeville circuit. He would, you know, when he could, and they needed somebody to fill in or be a banjo player, he would play the banjo. So I had this connection with vaudeville. So I auditioned and I got the part. <laughs> and I got to play the horse's ass. <laughs> literally i got to be the horse costume and, <laughs> and do that type of stuff and it was just so fun and i'm 70 i'm over 17 and a half i have just a couple months till my birthday and that opening weekend there of course was a party and my parents were very protective of me they were overly protective they were very protective of me told me i couldn't go and I was really upset. I had always been the good boy. My brother was the, the black sheep of the family. And I, my older brother, and I saw all that. was like, I'm not doing any of that. They would get fights and just, it was awful. And so I, I decided to not go down that path. 
And I was always a good kid, so I was really angry. I was very pissed off when my parents told me I couldn't go to this party. But I, I obeyed them, and I jumped on my bike. I had a Moto B cane, which is like an early moped. It's an English moped. Uh, and I got on my bike, and I was driving back home into the suburbs. And I, people, I'm sure, know that as you go into the suburbs, there are often really wide streets that lead into the developments. Right? There are these like four-lane streets that go in. No, nobody's on the streets. The feeder routes, and it's dark. Exactly. Yeah, and it's dark. And the street has a curve to it, like a big S, right? So I'm approaching that curve. I'm turning into the curve. There's a car that suddenly appears. Literally, I did not see this car come from anywhere. Suddenly, this car is behind me. Its headlights are flashing in my side mirrors, my side rear view mirrors, right? And as I'm turning into the curve, there is a parked semi-truck in that curve. And I try to go around the the semi-truck I'm not, I can't, I, I have several thoughts flash in my head really quickly. What am I going to do? Am I going to try to fit between the semi-truck and the car? Can I jump the curb and get on the sidewalk? But there was a cyclone, those metal cyclone fences right there. So I could lay my bike down. And I, before I could even make a full choice, the car hit my back tire and it pushed my back tire. I was probably going maybe 20 miles an hour. I was braking. Uh, the car pushed my tire, picked my bike up off the impact, picked my bike up and pushed me into the back of the park semi truck. Um, so the bike went under the truck, slid out through there. There was a, a wheel guard uh, underneath the truck at the bumper of the truck. And so I hit that and bounced off into the street and the car drove away. And it was in October. And I don't know if you know the weather, but you do a little bit the Bay Area in San Jose. The weather is just amazing. And it's those warm days and those cool, crisp sort of, you know, autumn, summer nights. Yeah, it's a beautiful time of year there. So this car didn't stop to help you. Oh, no. Did it, besides it hitting your tire, which threw you into the truck, did mm-hmm. did the car hit you too? I'm just trying to picture all the no. damage that happened. No, the car hit my bike, thrust my, I was already going 20 miles per hour. It, it sort of pushed my bike probably into a faster speed. I consciously jumped out of my body. So I didn't, my mentality, my consciousness didn't hit the truck. My body did. But I jumped out of my body in those seconds and watched the bike and the car hit the truck, or my bike and my body hit the truck, and watched the car drive away. I watched that whole thing. Before we go on, some people are going, huh, what? I can't do that. Is this a gift that you already had or did it just in the split second happen? It's something I had done previously. Uh, Just as a kid, I think it's like, you know, we call it astral projecting. Uh, I've never practiced it. I've done it a few times just while meditating without not being on purpose, just done it over the years. Uh, It's If anybody wants to look it up, it is called astral projecting. And it's bringing your consciousness, right, separating your consciousness there's a lot of people often talk about having a tether and stuff like that to link you always. But I jumped out of my body and watched that whole thing. And it was a beautiful experience. I remember thinking of what a gorgeous night it was. I think it was a full moon. Uh, I remember it just there was the sky was, even though it was probably around 1030 at night, 10, 30 at night. I, I watched the whole thing with this sense of just curiosity and detachment. There was, there was no... There was no pain. And I think that one of the lessons I learned is, I think is when we do go through the death process, often we can step out. We can have a choice. And I've, I've seen this before with other people of their dying processes. I've been around people and help people go through the process of, of transitioning and dying. And as us looking at people, maybe in the hospital bed, writhing in pain, what I discovered was, That's their body, but not necessarily their consciousness. That oftentimes they're really not even in their body while their body is going through this process of letting go of its human flesh. I I think that's a very common thing. And we get very upset about it because it's hard for us to look at someone suffering. And at the same time, I often don't think that that person is really there. 
So are they really suffering? In my case, no. There was really no suffering in the process of my transitioning, of my dying and letting go of my body. It was actually really beautiful. I think it's a choice that we can make. If people haven't done that, maybe I happen to believe because of these experiences and my my spiritual education, I happen to believe in reincarnation. I think we come back and we do these things many, many times. <laughs> and in that experience, if we've already experienced something, then maybe we don't have to do that again. We don't need to. Oh, I've already done that. I don't need to learn about that. So I can step out like I did and just watch the whole thing. People that listen to this show, this isn't new a new thing to us. Right. This is, we've had people on before that have talked about, hey, I was in this car accident where we came around a mountain road, icy mountain road, car slid off a cliff. And as the car is plunging off a cliff, uh, um, she said, I wasn't in my body. I was just watching. And I love how very matter of fact it is. It's not like, I was out of my body screaming bloody murder. No. It's, I'm just watching, like, okay. No fear, no yeah, fear, no, no fear. worry. And I've talked to other people, especially in horrific accidents of some sort, like traffic accidents yeah. that were out of their body when it happened. And they didn't feel the impact, whether it was off a cliff or a head-on collision. Um, and they hadn't practiced it or anything. They didn't even know the term astral travel like you're talking about. But they they had somehow, some way, right before the moment of collision, became uh, an observer, a witness, instead of experiencing the most traumatic thing that could ever happen. It's one of the I, I like to differentiate nowadays because there's so much uh, like ayahuasca and drug use where people have these experiences where they feel like they're dying. And I, I have to check myself because I get a little offended sometimes from this because, oh, my God, I died, too. Oh, tell me about your NTE. Oh, well, I took ayahuasca and and it was, oh, my God, I went through this death process. And I'm like, OK, that's all right. That's not exactly the same thing. Please don't call it that. You don't say that you died. Maybe your ego died. Maybe you had to face a bunch of like experiences and you had to kill off a part of you that needed to be released or something like that. But it's not the same thing. And I often hear these people, oh, yeah, I had a near-death experience. Well, no, 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 you didn't. <laughs> it's not exactly. like I like to say maybe a close-to-death experience or an ego-death experience or something of that, but that's not a near-death experience. Right. Or they may have had an out-of-body experience of some sort. Exactly. And IONS classifies those as near-death experiences just because they're putting this blanket term on all of it. Yeah. But yes, yeah, yeah. some things are different than others. Yeah, because in those experiences, there's a lot of fear. Yes. Those people feel so much fear. They feel so much pain. They feel this death, this dramatic type of, especially with the ayahuasca death experience, they feel these dramatic kind of, painful, ripping away type of things. And when I see people talk about near-death experiences, like, like like the one I had, it's very matter-of-fact, like you said. It's very, oh, it just happened. It's part of my story. It's part of my experience. There's really no drama with it. So that's why I like to think of the other one as an eco-death experience. Okay. Not quite the same. Anyway, super interesting. So we're just getting started here. Okay. Yeah. Let's jump back into it. So you're now crashing into a semi truck, a parked semi truck. Yeah. Yeah. What happens to your body and what happens to you? So I get to watch the whole thing. And that was not wonderful. I think it was a gift where I get to watch my body just get mangled and not feel it. What a great gift that was. Uh, and feel great. So my body itself, I shattered five vertebrae. I cracked five vertebrae. I split my right wrist open. I lost all the nerves in my right hand. Uh, I had undiagnosed brain damage and I shattered my left knee. So my knee was a very interesting uh, injury because it was from the back of the knee. So my kneecap was intact, but the bones leading into the knee had shattered in the joint to little tiny pieces, which 
was another just amazing experience because that's what a lot of football players get when they have a, a knee injury is from the rear. And they, my injury, they flew 14 surgeons in from the NFL to actually put my knee back together. And they ended up doing at the time a very experimental surgery where they glued all the little bone fragments together. I only have three little pins in my knee. So I had three metal pins in my knee. I had a big steel rod in my knee to, to stabilize it, and they took that out. And when those bones, those bones grafted back together, and they were stabilized because of that rod, they pulled the rod out, and those three little pins are the only thing there. So I, I feel very blessed by how the doctors were able to handle putting my bones back together. They had no idea what to do with me after that, <laughs> but I was able to walk. I couldn't dance. But, you know, I, one doctor told me I wouldn't be able to walk. And if I could, I'd have to have assistance with a wheelchair or a walker or something of that sort. And I beat their prognosis. I actually said a bad word to the doctor. I told the doctor to F off when he told me that, that there's no way they could. That's a prognosis in their opinion. That's not my life. And so I was a little sassy kid. <laughs> I've had a couple of doctors I've wanted to do that too, and I've had major injuries. Dr. Rogers, you don't know what I was thinking about you. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, keep going. Okay. So uh, my body was pretty shattered. I watched myself down there. I watched the car drive away, and I was just in this very serene, quiet place of just admiring the beauty of the night. It was so, like, the juxtaposition was just odd. Uh, and I was aware that it was odd. I was very aware that, oh, that's my body and I'm fine. I was very aware. Not only am I fine, but I actually feel good. So I'm out of my body. My body's over in the street. Nothing's happening. Again, it's a quiet suburban road. We have no record. The, the police record disappeared. We have no record of an ambulance. An ambulance was called. Someone called it. Someone, they, I saw the ambulance. Uh, as I was outside of my body and there's no police report. There's no ambulance record. There's nothing until I get to the hospital. So my parents home was about a half hour, 25 minutes from the hospital. And somebody at some point had to find me and then call the paramedics. Paramedics had to come out, which at that time, the response time was about 12 minutes. So in, in that time, I have no idea how much time it was because I didn't go back into my body fully until I woke up in the hospital. I was outside the at least for an hour that I could think of, that I'm aware of. I'm watching my body. The car drives away. It's a beautiful night. And suddenly I feel myself being pulled. I did the tunnel. So I feel myself being pulled into the tunnel. And that's, you know, very common. My tunnel was spinning so it was spinning clockwise and it was spinning clockwise and moving forward so the tunnel was rotating but also rotating in a direction it was a very interesting experience i think why that's so interesting to me is just my physics understanding and uh, quantum theory and you know that's like what the universe is like is, as our solar system is moving through space it's rotating but it's also going in a direction. It's not stagnant. And so my experience was very much like that. I was rotating clockwise, but I was also uh, spiraling towards something. And what is that tunnel looking like? Is it white? Is it dark? And there must have been some kind of, um, I, I don't know, structure or something to it to where you could actually tell that it was spinning. Yes. Right? If it was yeah, pure white, absolutely. for example, you wouldn't be able to tell. So give me some detail on the tunnel. So the tunnel that I went down was, it sort of had a base of white, but you know when you look through prisms and you see the, the white, the light gets shattered into rainbows? That's what my tunnel was like. It was full of light, was full of color, and it was full of depth. It was like, uh, I don't know how to say it exactly, but like if you were thinking of a cave and a crystal cave, and the crystals growing on the cave and some are going to be bigger or longer or have or be wider or whatever. 
that's kind of like what my space was. There was nothing solid about it. It felt like pure energy. So I couldn't necessarily see through it. It wasn't translucent, but it was just light. So it was, it's, it's hard to explain because it, again, it wasn't solid. My whole experience being on the other side, nothing was solid, but everything had form. And were you headed towards something down the tunnel? Was there something at the other end you were seeing? Yeah, I didn't see anything. I was just in a tunnel and I was enjoying the light and the movement and the, and the direction and the colors. And, and then all of a sudden it was, it was just in a, in a snap. Suddenly I was in a place. I have no idea what this place was. That place, like the tunnel, was full of light. I had this sensation that I was in a defined space. And yet at the same time, it felt infinite. It was, I felt like I was at a location and there was a sense of like it's stand, but I couldn't necessarily see a floor. It was kind of like that white energy, that light energy. And the colors there, I can't even explain. The colors are so brilliant. They're colors that we don't see in our daily human life. I, I got to think about it. I, I think I read once that seahorses have the ability to see twice as many colors as we see. And that's, that's amazing that there are more colors that exist even in the world that we're living in, in this physical world that we as human beings can interpret with the colors of our eyes. Like there's actually so much more out there that we just don't see. So try to describe one of them. I mean, I'm looking at that artwork behind you. There's red, blue, yellow, green. There's nearly everything orange. There's nearly everything in the rainbow in this kind of geometric abstract. Uh -huh. But are we looking towards the reds, towards the blues, or towards something you can't even describe at all? I can't describe it. It's just, it's as if our spectrum of color has, is multiplied, and I want to say by four. Like there's four other realms, spectrums of color that we are part of. You know, we see a particular section of that. But there's more, and the colors are just... The colors are more energy than color. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't think that makes any sense. The colors are more perception. In other words, it's not something you just see with your eyes. No, exactly. It's something that you feel. It's, it's literally physically. The colors, you feel the vibration and the frequency of the colors. Like they're tactile. There, you can touch them and you could feel them on um, the body that I had there. I was, I actually had a body there. I actually, it wasn't that I, I was disembodied. It wasn't that I was just pure energy. I personally had a shape. I had a form. I never saw a mirror of myself to see myself, but I could see my hands. I could see my feet. I knew my body was intact. I knew my legs were fine. I knew my spine was fine. Right. I knew my face that had gotten ripped open. I knew it was fine. You didn't see a mirror, but you felt like it was more of a human form, like your regular fingers, toes, et cetera. OK. Yeah. Yeah. I can look down and see my legs and my legs fully functioned. You know, I had my toes. I had my legs. I was I was a very I would get I was a dancer. So I was very strong. I was very long and lean and sinewy and all that was still there. Like I could see my arms, I could see whatever you can see looking at your body without a mirror, right? I could look down and I could see my hips, I could see my elbows, I could see, you know, these parts of me. So I had the same form that I have now, and I had the same structure uh, that I have now. And in this place of feeling and frequency and light and vibration, I... Uh, I, I don't know how to describe it, and I'm sure you've heard this many times. If you take the word joy or bliss, like the, let's say in the English language, the happiest word that you could use, the word with the most, I think it's joy, right? Joy is above all emotions, right? The joy or bliss. I agree. It's way deeper than happiness. Happiness can be very fleeting. Joy is much deeper and much more eternal. It comes from within. Yeah. And it's this in this joyful experience 
of being in this place. It's inside of me. I feel the joy. I am the joy. Multiply that by a million and maybe you'll get a fraction close to the understanding of what it is on the other side. A fraction close to that understanding. It is the most beautiful, blissful, joyous, happy, expansive, conscious, gorgeous, amazing experience being dead. <laughs> sure. I wish I had more adjectives for you to fill in because I could tell you could use a million of them. And they still wouldn't come close right. to this frequency, this vibration, to this feeling tone. They just wouldn't from this beingness because it really is a beingness. It's like your whole self, every cell, every part of your consciousness, every part of me was lit up and filled with this joy. And it wasn't like being high. It was fully aware. It wasn't like being like unconscious or detached. It's not like people describe trips or drug trips or something like that. It, it was full consciousness. In fact, more conscious than I think we can be as human beings, at least in this earthly plane. There was this access to self, to everything, like the capital S self, to the divine itself. I love this. Keep your train of thought. I'm going to sidetrack us for just a second. Okay. Why, if you felt that and it was that amazing, when you came back, why didn't you just commit suicide to get back there? Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I never tried to consciously plan out suicide, but for at least 20, 20 years, if not more, I would put myself into situations where I could have left. I could have died. I, I, I could have ended my life. I had four experiences after that where I was severely hospitalized and I had to consciously choose to stay. And you did. And I did. I didn't want, there was something, there is something holding me here. There's something that's saying, nope, not yet, not time. Even when I've been in my most, because I, I have, I've had quite a few dark nights of soul in my life. I've had quite a few of those experiences of just being like, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I don't want to be here. And there's something when I get to that place that keeps me here. There's, I'm here for some purpose. If somebody is having a really, really hard day today as they're hearing this, please tell them something that's going to help keep them here. That they have, there's a reason they're here. That their life is important, that their life is valuable, that they are already and have already achieved their purpose in life. They are already fulfilling. So many people are, I feel useless. Nobody loves me. I'm not receiving my purpose. And I'm going to get a little spiritual on people that I think we are all emanations of the divine. I think God in itself is getting to know itself through us. We are like a wave on the ocean. And that's part of what I made mean, my studies and that experience of being crossed over has taught me that I come from, we come from divine source. We are pure divine source in human form. And just by being here and being in human form, you are already achieving your purpose. Beautiful. Your purpose is to be an expression of the divine. And if that expression is sad, be sad. Great. Own it. It's the divine getting to know itself. People say, well, why would God make that? Well, God would make that because God wants to know all of the human possibilities. God wants to know every human possibility. God wants to know what it's like to be itself in a handicap, like what I have. God wants to know what it's like to be itself unhappy. God wants to know what it's like to be itself in joy and bliss as the human experience. I think we are all that consciousness getting to understand itself. When you stop thinking in the old ways of, oh, well, why would God want pain in the world? Well, we are in the consciousness of the divine. And that pain is an opportunity for us to move closer to the divine, to choose, to make that choice. We have free will. Thank you. We're jumping back on the track now. Okay. Okay. You were talking, well, about the beautiful colors, about the amazing feeling that 
of joy that is inexplicable and how the form of you was either the same or similar to your form now in this life. Okay, keep going with your experience. So I'm on the other side and I'm, I start to get very curious of like, well, where is everybody? Because I had this idea that when you die, my dead dog was going to be there. My great grandmother and, you know, my ancestors or people that were part of my family were going to greet me and, and bring me through the pearly gates. <laughs> and there was nobody there. Where were they? <laughs> and where were they? Exactly. Not disappointing. Well, so this is part of the learning that I took away from this experience too, was that, and I wasn't upset that they weren't there. It was just pure curiosity. There wasn't a judgment about it. It was just, oh, where is everybody? I thought they were, I thought I was going to get to see my dead dog. I really want to see my dead dog. (laughs) And so I'm on the other side. I'm exploring this space. And in this space, I'm aware that, again, like I said, it's, it's a defined space, but there's really no ceiling. I feel like I'm standing on something, but I look down and there's really no floor. There's just frequency and vibration and energy. I'm so curious about this space. I'm moving about it. I'm curious where everybody is. I have no idea how long it's there. It felt like a long time. And not in a negative way, just it felt like time had really gone by in that place. And then suddenly I turn around and there is this man standing in front of me. And the moment I turn around, so that's an interesting thing because I have consciousness where I could turn around. Like I'm viewing this space in a way like a human still. I'm viewing this space. My eyes are in front of me. I'm taking everything in. And I have to turn to see that, oh, there's somebody else here. So I turn to see that there's somebody else here. When I do, I feel like my breath, which I don't know how that works, because, but I feel like my breath is taken out of me. My chest is splitting open. And there's this ecstatic experience of recognition, of, I, of love. It's an ecstatic. I, I used to read a lot about um, medieval nuns talking about their marriage to Christ. <laughs> and they would talk about this heart-wrenching, chest-breaking, painful experience of their chest splitting open. And I'm like, oh my God, that's what they're talking about. I literally felt this love that was just being ripped through me. And at the same time, my mind is saying, who the hell is this? I don't know who this guy person is. He looks, he's an Asian man. He looks like Lao Tzu or Fu Manchu, like this traditional uh, Brit, like Chinese British man. I, I go back to the phrase to the understanding of maybe Hong Kong in 1880 or something like that. He's like, He's wearing a tweed suit, but again, he's holographic, right? I can see through him, yet there's texture and there's color to the fabric. And I remember being so curious about the weave of the fabric and seeing the depth of the fabric and the, the weave itself in the fabric. Anyway, all this is happening at the same time. My heart, my chest is being ripped up and my heart is, is just reaching out. There's this ecstatic love. There's this curiosity. Who the hell is this? Who the heck is this guy? (laughs) Right? He and and the same consciousness of is God Asian? (laughs) What's going on? And he has like the the mustache, the Fu Manchu mustache, the long wispy beard, tweed suit, and and he says to me, What are you doing here? (laughs) And I just kind of look at him and the 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 conversation goes along the lines of where I feel this love. I feel the love coming back to me. It's a, a receiving that's happening as well. My body is literally like vibrating. The body that I'm, the energetic body that I'm in. And she's saying, what are you doing here? And I, I'm confused. I'm like, well, I'm dead. <laughs> I'm very clear that I'm not back there. Uh, and this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm dead. And he says, you're not supposed to be here. And with that, with that being told, I'm not supposed to be here. All of my, I want to call it human, my, my anger that I said I was feeling before I died from my parents, right? All of that anger, the feeling of being rejected, 
feeling of being unwanted, which was my Billy Elliot story, that story of not fitting in. All of that comes back to you. He says, you're not supposed to be here. It's not time. And then literally snap, I'm back hovering over the accident. I'm no longer on the other side. I'm not in my body. I am watching the paramedics as they come and get me. And I literally said, my last words in heaven or whatever this place is called, my last words, like I said earlier to that doctor, who were F you? <laughs> Those are my last words. <laughs> and that anger is what brought me bound. So I told God or whoever this was to F off. <laughs> and with that, I was back watching the paramedics as their truck parked, as they, op- they got out of the truck. I saw them open in the back doors. I saw them take out the gurney. I saw each of them doing the job that they were doing. One was, I remember, one was African-American, one was Latino. The African-American guy is pulling out the gurney. The uh, No, the Latin guy is pulling out the journey gurney. The African-American guy is on top of me, check, I'm guessing, checking my pulse. His face is super close to mine. Uh, he, I assume he's trying to feel if there's a breath or see if there's any movement or anything like that. And then in a split second again, I'm in my body. I open my eyes. He, like Tigger, like the cat, pound jumps, like all of his body in one movement just jumps up. And this is a big man. Just boom, he's up in the air. I must have scared the crap out of him. <laughs> I told him to take me to the hospital, that my insurance card was in my back pocket, and then I was back out of my body. I did not want to be in that body. I did not want to be there. I did not want to be alive in human form again. Did not want that at all. I watched them put my God body on the gurney. I watched them put me in the truck, close the doors, go around to the front of the truck, get in and drive away. And I said to myself, I am not going there. But you weren't back in that beautiful place either, were you? Nope. No, and this is where I I have no idea, my curiosity. I started to think, oh, again, I'm not in that sense of pain. I'm still still curious because like I was before I went to the other side, I was still in that detached kind of, oh, I'm looking at my body. My body's down there. That must really hurt. I'm in that state. And I'm saying to myself, I guess this is how ghosts are made because I don't want to go back in that. So if my body then dies and I'm not on the other side, maybe I'm a ghost. (laughs) So how did you change your mind? Well, I did. So my next conscious memory is I'm back in my body. I open my eyes. I see the white of the stuff, the drop ceiling. And I'm so disappointed. And I know I'm in the hospital. I start. I started to cry. I, I don't want to be there. Explain all the emotions that you were crying over. The disappointment. You know, it's like ripping a kid out of the candy shop when they really, really want candy. <laughs> Frustration. Frustration, sadness, anger. Oof, that anger, the blame. Uh, well, this happened because of my parents. If they would have just let me go to that party, this wouldn't happen. This happened with blame of why would God kick me out? Why would I not be accepted in heaven? I'm not accepted anywhere now, right? That's what I was being told by culture, society, right? I didn't fit in. I wasn't okay for me to be me. I was angry at that withdrawal of what felt like a withdrawal of love. And that shattered my heart, that sadness, it affected me for decades, that experience. It took me a lot of healing work to actually put the pieces of my heart back together in that moment, and from that moment. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Let me just interject for those that are keeping score. I promised we were going to hear something different today. <laughs> and Fu Manchu in a tweed suit. That just might be the title of this podcast. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's you got it. <laughs> Why do you think that the 
being that you saw, and, and, and if you think it's God say so, or some other kind of being, why do you think that's how that being appeared to you? You know, I thought about that a lot. And my understanding of God from these experiences, from, you know, my learning and growing and curiosity of, of this world that we live in, my understanding of God is God is everything. Father, mother, Hachimama, whatever you want to call it. You can't escape God. So we are, it's the forest through the trees. You know, people say, well, where's God? God's right there. God is that divine spark that lives deep within you. God is that joy. God is the literally the breath that you breathe. Even science is talking about a holographic universe or the universe that is that is breath. Right? We are breathing in God every day. Every time you take a breath, you are one, you are connected. It God is breath itself. Uh, this person on the other side, this God, part of God. I again, I, I my whole life I have had a connection to Asian culture. The only thing I've ever collected was um these deities that you that you carve, you ask a, a craftsman to carve for you and you put it on the altar and the deity might be a scholar, might be an angel, might be a guardian, whatever it is. And then you ask the deity, it's just like a St. Michael's crystal or, or metal. You ask it to bestow its gifts upon you, whether it's protection or guardianship or guidance or knowledge or whatever it is. It's the only thing I've ever collected. I've always been drawn to that. Maybe that was a propensity of a past life. Maybe it's a previous life experience. Maybe that was my guardian angel. And my guardian angel is in that form. I, I have never been able to figure it out. I know that that experience, that person, let's say, was a representation of the divine. I don't think it's any different, though, from your being a representation of the divine. And on that other side, all of our human pettiness, all of that ego stuff goes away. And the divine can take any form it wants. It is, we are the divine understanding itself in the many, many millions, billions, and trillions of ways that it can. So my question I always come back to myself is, well, why couldn't God be through that shoe? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> You've obviously spent a lot of years thinking deeply about all of these things. How has this experience changed your life? And and from a 17-year-old, maybe changed the whole path that you were on besides just the dance issue? And did it end your dance career? It did. It ended my dance career. I could, I never could go back to my body just cannot handle that type of movement. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. So besides the physical things, how did it change you? Well, first there's a deep gratitude that I could even walk. And to this day, I'm in my fifties that I could still walk because back then I was told I wouldn't be able to. So the fact that I, you know, within a year of my accident i was already walking and i was attempting to take dance classes just the fact that i could be in a class i couldn't i couldn't succeed in it anymore but the fact that i could like walk down and do a pot of meringue <laughs> you know so like that that in itself is just an incredible gift and a blessing right there now i look back and i am grateful for my murder because I think that what was the car behind me, I think it was done purposefully. There were a lot of people in the Bay Area. My feeling from that very moment was that it was done on purpose. And there's a part of me that even says, I think I know, like there's a feeling that I know who did it, but I've never consciously been able to pinpoint who that was. And I don't need to. And I really don't do anymore. No, there's probably nothing positive to come of that. But why do you think why do you think someone tried to murder you? I I don't I I there's a perception when I look when I can look into the rear view mirror. So I'm on a bike, right? And there's two mirrors coming up on the side that let me see, you know, behind me. And there's this idea that I can see the person that's in that mirror. 
that I recognize who that is. Maybe it was just somebody who was angry. Um, maybe it was somebody who hated gay people and wanted to remove us from the earth. I, I, I have no idea. I mean, I've had guns pointed at me, knives pointed at me. I've had groups of people, you know, surround me and tell me horrible things. I had employers fight, fire me. I've had, you know, put people put knives up to my face. I've had all kinds of stuff. People I don't even know who don't like me. And they tell me they don't like me because I'm gay. And I'm not one of those people that can hide it. <laughs> I know a lot of people say, well, you can hide it. You don't have to be that way. Well, no, I have a peak neon triangle above my head that everybody sees. <laughs> so well, it's it's there. It's always there. <laughs> Pink neon triangle. Yeah, it's like okay. flashy. You know, it's like flashing these lights above my head. Yeah. Saying, Yay. You know, I can't find who I am. And I know there's some people who can't. You know, uh, but for me, I'm, I've never been that person that could really do that. Well, unfortunately, I think in, in this earth existence, we're not going to come to a point anytime soon where everybody has the kind of love that they need to for everybody. Yeah, we could just keep loving everybody and making those choices. And that's one of my one of my takeaways. I from my death experience, one of my takeaways is that accidents are real. A lot of people say, oh, there's no such thing as accidents. You know, everything's meant to happen. And, you know, maybe. And I certainly can't prove it. I think that as a, as a species, as, as evolutionary beings, we are all going in the singular direction. But how we get there, we bump into each other. And we have free will. And if you're going to have free will, then you have to make room for accidents. There are, we make mistakes. We go down wrong paths. We make choices that are out of alignment with the love of the divine and accidents happen. And so I truly believe in accidents. I don't think they're bad things. I believe we all get back on course, right? Like that tunnel, we were going in a direction, right? Now, how we get there, well, accidents can happen. <laughs> I, I believe that too. I don't think everything is predestined for us. I don't either. It just doesn't make sense to me. So how else did this experience change the trajectory of your life? Oh, it recreated my entire life because as a, as a kid, I started as an actor at around eight years old. And that was how I, that was my vision, my perception of myself. Uh, it took me a while. I struggled with chronic, chronic pain. I had to learn how to walk again. I had fibromyalgia and I had arthritis and asthma, and bronchitis. My white blood cells were attacking my red blood cells. My hemoglobin was splitting at different times, shutting down my organs. I severely dehydrated a few times to the point of if I hadn't gotten medical intervention, I would have died. And those are those sort of what I like to say close to death experiences that I uh, went through. And I was lost. I felt like I had no purpose. I had no reason to be here. I had been, you know, kicked out of heaven. And I've come to now be grateful and to either bless my, my murder. I have come to be in a place of, of just never wanting to change that. If anybody gave me the opportunity to go back in time and change that, I wouldn't. You know, I got my master's degree. I learned so much. I became a therapist. I've helped thousands of people to heal. I taught around the world. I, I consulted at Stanford University. I wrote a book that was published by Simon & Schuster. Like these gifts, and especially the gift of being able to sit down with someone and witness their pain on a deep level. I could not do that if it wasn't for the gift of that near-death experience. Why did you want to be on this podcast today? Because I love sharing that message. I love sharing that message that death isn't something to be afraid of. It's something to be embraced. I love sharing the message that you can't get this wrong. You can't get this wrong. You are so loved. You already have fulfilled your purpose just by being here as an expression of the divine. You mentioned the book. If people want to learn more about your experience and what you learned from it, where should they look that up? Yeah, so I wrote this book. It's called Convergence Healing. That has become my brand, how I put myself out in the world. 
Convergence, C-O-N-V-E-R-G-E-N-C-E, -E, Convergence Healing, Healing Pain with Energetic Love. I wrote it really for my clients. And then Simon and Schuster got a hold of it. I didn't even try to sell it. They bought it and published it. It was just amazing. So they could find my book. I, I recorded the Audible audio version on Audible. It's on Kindle. It's on Amazon. It's at Barnes & Noble. It, you, know, you can get it pretty much everywhere. So I wrote that book. I have a new book coming out this September called Billy and the Anxiety Monster. <laughs> How to Love Your Anxiety and Heal. And I get to share these experiences with people. I get to live what I love. I get to work what I love and do what I love. And so I don't really work. <laughs> I just share these lessons and learnings and experiences and help other people and hold their hand as they go through there. Sounds like a great life. Thanks for sharing. Any last thoughts? Any last thoughts? I think that what this world needs more than anything is that joy, that bliss, that love. And I, as a therapist, a lot of people are suffering in the world. And there's a lot of division. There's a lot of hatred. There's a lot of anger at ourselves, at our own bodies. And I'm hoping that people will look at their pain, not as something to medicate, not as something to cut away or throw away or be embarrassed or ashamed of, but to look at their pain as a part of them that's suffering. And what that part needs more than anything is not your anger or your frustration that it's there. What it needs is your love. So for those who are listening, if there's a part of you that's suffering, whether it's a physical part in your body, whether it's a mental part in your mind or a spiritual part in your heart, I ask you to bring love to that part. Hold it, embrace it, accept it. Give it the love that it needs in order to heal. Stop being a bully to it. Stop telling it to go away. Stop medicating it and drugging it and, you know, wanting to cut it out. Do what you need to do. Follow your own instincts. But bring love to the part that's suffering. If we actually choose to do that in the world for ourselves, we contribute to what I think is the tipping point of bringing more and more of that love of the divine into this life that we are living now. Thanks, Peter. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks again for listening, and remember to share this podcast. To be notified when the next episode goes live, follow us on your podcasting app or click over to roundtripdeath.com and sign up for our email newsletter. One last thing. We are continually trying to improve this podcast and we value your feedback. If you have a comment about what you like or what we can do better, or a near-death experiencer that we should have on the show, send an email to eric at roundtripdeath.com, and that's Eric with a C. Until then, I wish you everything good that you're looking for in this life and the next. Music